of this like a big what if. What if we could bring you unique content, stories you've never seen, never heard before, and what if we could do all of that under a title that fits the project? Thus, our Originals team was born. My name is Chris Vanderveen, and I'm heading this effort here at Nine News. Over the next hour, we'll show you what we've been working on. Stories like this first one. You might have heard about it, but until we told it, you hadn't heard a particular chapter of it. 2019, fiery truck crash kills four, truck driver sentenced to prison. Time reduced by Governor Jared Polis. Now you probably know that part, but what about the company that put the semi driver in the front seat in the first place? That's where this originals report fills in some pretty critical details. He's going that truck ramp, the truck ramp. Oh, he's just swerving. Physics suggests an object in motion will stay in motion. Oh my God! Right up to the moment. Jesus Christ, we almost died! It interacts with something else. Consider it a lesson in force. Like when an out of control semi collides with car after car after car. The driver survived, and yet his story, this story, was set in motion long before the day. I keep myself distracted a lot because... The day that left Gage Evans, a widow. Um, I'm trying to figure out who I am. Her husband, Bill Bailey, was 67. He died in a crash so violent at least one who survived. Hi, can you hear me okay? Couldn't immediately reply to the questions of a 911 operator. Hello, are you there? My husband didn't die in a car accident. My husband was killed by a reckless truck driver. I take the responsibility. The jury concluded as much last year. Others have now concluded something else. The driver himself should never have been in that truck. Mike McCormick represents the family of Doyle Harrison, one of four who died. Not long after the crash, McCormick deposed the woman who hired Rogel Aguilera Medeiros to drive the one truck she owned. Did Yami Segura have any business running a trucking business? In my judgment, no. Yami Segura ran Castellano 03 Trucking out of her Houston home. When asked why she did this, she said, well, my neighbor have a, has a trucking company and they've, they've made some good money at it, so I thought I would too. During the deposition and reported here for the first time, McCormick asked, did you consult any professionals to assist you in getting the company started? No, she replied. She went online to learn how to run a trucking company. That's what she testified to, yes. You did that basically online, researching various websites to get that information? Uh-huh. She then formed a limited liability corporation to protect her assets from lawsuits, and according to this federal report, acquired a $750,000 insurance policy, the minimum she needed under federal law. What company do you work for now? In the spring of 2019, she hired Aguilera Maderos despite the fact that, according to federal investigators, his application was missing his most recent previous employer. A problem, considering that employer stated that he fired Rohel because he did not know how to drive a stick shift. His commercial driver's license was less than a year old. The people that put him in that truck or allowed that truck to be on the road didn't do their job. McCormick says that includes not just the trucking company, but the shipping broker that hired Castellano 03 to run her out with its one new driver. A driver federal investigators found did not receive required training prior to operating a semi. In fact, Aguilera Medeiros was less than two weeks into the job when Castellano 03 sent him in a truck with automatic transmission from Fort Collins into Wyoming. The route was relatively flat. He arrived at this lumber yard, loaded up and left. It was here he had a choice, go back the same way or head south into the heart of Colorado's mountains. Okay, okay. 
In search of that cheaper price, he chose the latter, south into towns like Riverside and Walden. A surveillance camera captured him tailgating an SUV in Granby. Prosecutors believe he really started to misuse his brakes on the way down Berthoud Pass. Was he qualified enough to drive the truck? Not for the route he, t he chose to take. Bill Bailey's brother, Gage's brother-in-law, knows precisely what happened next. Missing this runaway truck ramp was a fatal mistake, prosecutors said. Instead, he continued to ride his brakes, eventually causing them to fail right when he needed them the most. The only thing I remember here is that I thought I was going to die because when I was low and without the brakes, the truck hit 85 miles. And I pressed the timer. Yes, we just cured anxiety. Oh! Bill Bailey loved the absurd <laughs> about as much as he loved making model rockets. Just a great brain and a great big heart. He made everything more fun. The day after he died, the common law husband of Yami Segura started a new trucking company, records say, out of the same Houston home. Months later, Castellano 03 dissolved. Portions of its bare bones $750,000 insurance policy never did make it to all of the victims and their families. Dwayne kept, you know, suggesting that I hire a lawyer. By the time Gage Evans did so, there was nothing left and no assets to try to recover. And when they filed by July of 2019, um, all the money was gone already. A series of events set in motion long before a semi loaded with lumber came barreling down one of the most dangerous stretches of roads in Colorado. A lesson, not just in force, says Gage Evans, but of a system that lacks the will to stop it. Three years on, almost three years, um, I don't know what the future looks like. I, d I don't know what my life holds in store. Segura told me she did not know just how inexperienced her own driver was. The new company, tied to her home, has now too lost its insurance policy. It's out of business. It, it bothered me and it really bothered me because he seemed like he really needed help, like he obviously needed help. A man's murder in his home shows cracks in the country's health care and criminal justice system. Next on the Nine News Original Special. There may be no better way to tell you about some massive gaps in the state's mental health care system than to show you one of the consequences. One man turned away over and over and over again before going into another man's home and killing him. We spent months investigating not the crime itself, but what happened during the days that preceded it. We want to give you a heads up. This story does include several mentions of suicide. Nine one one. What's the address of the emergency? Hello. Will you promise me one thing? What's that? You're just gonna shoot without no questions. What's your name, sir? From room two three seven, he calls nine one one. I just want to say f it all. A stranger tells operators. What's that noise? You don't my gun. He intends to die. And it's a 100% promise. That's just the fact. It's either by your officer's hand or my own. How concerned are you for the officers that are in the field at that moment? Absolutely concerned. Molly McDaniel answers three of his six calls. It was clear that he needed help um, just by the things that he was saying. My name is Molly. And it's nice to meet you, Molly. He tells her, type this into YouTube. 
and I'd pop up immediately with my face talking through a Sally Port 4. Let me see. I see you. And he was very deliberate. He wanted me to see that video. A 2006 documentary featuring a young Iowa inmate named Brian. Is that your name? It is. Recording. It's why Louisville officers know his name. Hey Brian, how's it going? When they finally find him. You want to smoke a cigarette outside? You got any weapons in your hand? No, no weapons on you? Okay, he's coming out the door. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Can you keep your hands up for us? Brian needs help, they conclude. Help a mental health hospital known as Centennial Peaks offers. The problem is, this night, it has only one person in intake, and she's worried about her safety. So officers opt for UC Health Long's Peak. And this is how it works. Listen, this is how it works. Not long after the officer drops him off and leaves, Brian does the same. While Brian has not been evaluated, the hospital staff did not view him as a threat to himself. To accept this call, press 5 now. By phone, Brian offers more detail. I told the security guard, I'm like, hey man, nobody's talking to me, so I'm just gonna leave. He's like, I'll walk you off the property. Just blew my mind. Molly McDaniel learns of the release the next day. It, it bothered me, and it really bothered me because he seemed like he really needed help. Like, he obviously needed help. He needed somebody. Well, if I'm not under arrest, then what is all this then, huh? Two days later, Brian comes to the Louisville Police yeah. Headquarters. You're just going to keep these on for the next day and not lose them. Huh? This time, officers try another hospital at Vista Adventist. Right here. And this time, Let's have a seat real quick for me, right? They wait with him. Until he talked to somebody. That's how it works. What? Uh, Spend hours all night next day waiting for somebody? Like I was trying to do at the other hospital? Inside the room, we know hospital staff completes a court ordered mental health evaluation. We also know when it's done, this hospital also lets him go. And in this case, it highlights even when the police are bringing the person to the front door of the hospital, how difficult that can be. Boulder's chief prosecutor, Michael Doherty, says this is when officers decided to take Brian to jail for those earlier 911 calls. I mean, he was clearly going through some very significant issues and challenges. Mr. Murray, your case is 21 CR 1941. Inside a courtroom, prosecutors seek a $25,000 bond on a possible felony charge. Mr. Murray is a significant danger to the community. His defense asks for what's known as a PR bond, basically a no cash up front promise to return. We'll let Brian tell you what happens next. Were you surprised when the judge in Boulder County let you go? I'm not gonna lie, I was, uh, I was very shocked. Okay, I want you to stay on the line with me, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on the line with you, okay? His full name, Brian Murray, and his is a story of a broken system with real consequences. In four days, he left two ERs, one jail, before finally doing this. Oh my God. Okay, okay. I, I've got help on my way, okay? In need of cash to get out of the state, Brian Murray went to Denver and into the home of a man he knew. He left in that man's car. Why, why do you think you're dead? Because there's blood all over the floor, and there's blood all over him. Stu Hable's wife found Stu in their basement, battered and beaten. I will never see the old Stu. All I see is his dead body. Yeah. That's the only image that I carry in my mind. Yeah. Paige and Stu Hable knew Brian. He'd helped them move some things years prior, did some odd jobs for them too. Did you ever see Brian's temper? No, never saw his temper. She didn't know he'd spent 20 years in prison, didn't know he'd spent most of those years untreated for a mental illness while living in solitary confinement, didn't know until we told her what had happened in the days leading up to her husband's murder. If any one of a number of things happen along the way, this doesn't happen. Right, right. I think that the system is, is hugely broken. Brian agrees. Do you think if they didn't release you that Stu would still be alive? Absolutely. 
absolutely, 100%. In the days that followed, in the days before police found him, Well, if I'm going down, I'm going down big, brother. Brian yeah. called in more threats. If your guys want a war, give it to you because I'm not going down these. In the end, however, he surrendered without a fight. To that charge, how do you plead guilty or not guilty? Guilty. He'll likely die in prison for killing Stu Habel. 60 years for him at the age of 41 is a life sentence. But he did tell me this from his prison cell. When I was at the hotel in Louisville, my brain was, was starting to get screwed up. Like, I know because I did 19 years in prison and I spent all those years in solitary and I know what's up bad coming. Brian Murray asked to be put in jail. Brian Murray asked to be hospitalized. Paige Habel lost more than a husband last year. I lost not only my partner, my sense of stability, my security, my safety, my home, and an innocent sense of trust. Daily, I see my views of the world I lived in changing dramatically. The system has let me down. Let down by a system that let go of a man. They had him in their custody and they let him go. Each of the hospitals told us through various spokespersons they couldn't comment on this case because of patient confidentiality issues. The judge that issued the PR bond also chose not to comment. I just realized this was my last moments with my mother and I just want to tell her I love her. So that's what I did. I, I don't even know. I just said I love you, mommy. WIA alerts are supposed to tell us when to evacuate in an emergency situation. That's if they're used, which we found isn't happening often enough. Not long after the Marshall Fire blew up in Boulder County in the last few days of 2021, we started looking into why so few people got an alert that the fire was coming. In this day and age, we rely on our cell phones for just about everything. But the Marshall Fire showed us when it comes to emergency information, you can't count on your phone to keep you safe. Here's Steve Steger with our Originals team. December 30, 2021, 30804 p.m. Magdalene, what's the address of the emergency? Hey, my home! Hey, my home! Lucha, please! It's Louisville. We're supposed to be evacuated. As flames closed in, how will I know when it's time to evacuate? A few knew what to do. We will send another notification if it's on mandatory evacuation. And the notification will come through on my cell phone. It's a system that you have to sign up for if you don't have a landline. It's called Everbridge. So we were checking in with social media and it seemed like there was a fire over on Marshall Road somewhere. Chris and Jane Fuller thought the danger was still miles away. And we didn't really think anything of it. It wasn't. Chris looked out of the window and up the street there were flames coming from our house just, you know, six or seven houses up. And at that point, it was just uh, panic. Panic, thanks, they say, to zero notice for them or for others near St. Andrew's Lane. We didn't get any notification at all. Nothing. And we never got it. Well, it's a failure. It's a failure. It's an abject failure. I mean, it makes me angry, frankly. I expected somebody to call me or text me on my phone and say, it's time to evacuate. Jane Fuller's anger is due to the fact that Boulder County had a system that could have alerted her cell phone and every phone in the area. The expectation should be that we're using every tool we can to alert people. And yet Boulder County's Mike Chard knows that system had yet to go live. He blames, among other things, the pandemic. And we hit COVID. And we were, you know, in operational response to COVID. Uh, the priority was dealing with saving lives in the county. 
Here's why that matters. The day of the fire, Boulder was only set up to alert cell phone users who had signed up or opted in to receive warnings. And that day in Boulder County, only 24% of cell phone users had opted in. If we would have known that this was gonna hit on the 31st, obviously there could have been some reprioritization of it. Had that reprioritization worked, Boulder would have used a now decade old system known as WIA, or Wireless Emergency Alerts, a system designed in theory to alert every cell phone in a specific area. The federal government calls WIA an essential part of America's emergency preparedness. Chard admits the Marshall Fire was bad and could have been worse. Could have been, yeah, absolutely. You know, nighttime would have changed the dynamic on this for sure. Just a moment. I'm trying to see if we have any reports of a fire there. We have a bunch of fires right now um, in, in Sonoma County. So. In 2017, the residents of Sonoma County, California, she thinks she can't get out, found out what can happen when alerts fail to reach everyone. Uh, we don't have the resources to just go help her out, so I'm going to let them know she's there, but they're active. I keep trying to call my mother. No answer. So then she calls me. Jessica Tunis spent part of that October night listening to hell. So I just said, Mom, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to reach you. There's a big fire. I don't even know how I got that sentence out without her the scream. Her, she's like, my house is on fire. My house is on fire. I'm like, what? It's like, does not compute. Like, there's no evacuation notice for your neighborhood. Like, how could this happen? The Tubbs fire destroyed 5,000 homes, killed 22. Many never knew it was coming. And I said, Mom, you just, you got to get to a window. You got you to jump. You got to do something. I'm like begging her, begging her to please jump out of the house. And I, re I don't know, I reverted to like, I reverted to a child. And I just started telling her, I love you, Mommy. I love you, Mommy. I haven't called her Mommy since I was probably 10. And I just realized this was my last moments with my mother and I just want to tell her I love her. So that's what I did. I, I don't even know. I just said I love you, Mommy, a lot of times. And then she screamed and then the phone went dead. Linda Tunis died in a county that also had WIA but chose not to use it. At that point in time, WIA was essentially an untested system. And so they elected not to use the WIA system during that warning event. Chris Godley came into this office to change that. There was a failure of trust, if you would. People felt let down by their local government, that the government should have been able to identify and warn them ahead of time. He added staff just for WIA. In the five years he's been here, the county has now sent three dozen WIA alerts no one has died. The public demands a level of service that's not been seen before. The cell phone is kind of how we do business these days. So if you're not making use of that technology, you may be disappointing your residents. They've learned from our mistake, 100%. Jessica Tunis says now. She loves her bingo. She trusts the county where her mom died. Oh, I'm confident. That, yeah, they are going to alert. Yet in the country, WIA remains underutilized. We found in Colorado, for example, 10 counties don't even have it. Another five are still working to set it up. Remember Jane Fuller from Louisville? I had been on a trip a, a couple years ago with my sisters in Sonoma, in the Sonoma area. Yes, the same Sonoma County in California. And all three of us received an, uh, an evacuation notice from being near a fire zone. She learned the value of those WIA alerts. So when smoke approached her Colorado home late last year, she thought another alert would certainly come. That's what I was expecting. That's what I was waiting for, a notification like the one I had in California to say, you need to evacuate now. I'm in Louisville and, and yet, I want as to you to now know, what's your order to evacuate it about? never did. I'm sorry? What's your Since answer? the Marshall Fire, Boulder County has finally turned on its WIA system. I guess what I would tell them is we've gotten better since this fire. We've implemented this system. We've used it already. Twice, in fact. Warnings Jane Fuller welcomes. In light of the day, too many were left in the dark. There's no excuse. We assumed there would have been an emergency alert. You know, there needs to be some kind of system that ha 
accesses everybody and tells them what's happening. Literally millions of lives depend on the technologies here. It's no longer a luxury to have a cell phone. This is how we live now. And so we need to make sure these systems can perform at that public safety standard where people have the same confidence that they'll get those warnings as they would if they had to call 911. Emergency managers in Colorado counties that have yet to use WIA have a whole host of different reasons as to why that is. But the most common problem is a lack of resources in emergency management. The state's Division of Emergency Management wants all Colorado counties in the system by the end of 2023. I died. I was dead. I know not everyone believes in God, but it was a miracle. She died of an overdose but a life-saving medication is the reason why she's alive today. You know things are not good. Opioids continue to kill Coloradans in an unprecedented rate. And so there might be no better way to show you what we're up against than to show you how many are desperately trying to combat it. Narcan. You've seen the stories on the life-saving drug, but you haven't seen it quite like this on body camera videos attached to those called in to save. Every one will show you was a success. Mark Salinger and photojournalist Foster Gaines show us what it takes to bring someone back from the brink. Seconds do matter when it comes to some of these things. Seconds, seconds count. Somebody stops breathing. As hope fades, seconds pass. Take control, sir! Fast. Sir! Too fast. Sir! Go to the other side. Capital Nine Baker One, can you start medical? I'm gonna be doing an art camp. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I need a, an ambulance quickly. I came oh, back well, to my friend's right. apartment and she's like overdosed. <laughs> she's sir, not breathing. I have, sir, I have help on the way. Okay. On this call. I was right down the street, maybe a block away. Arapahoe County Sheriff's Deputy Chris Calderon Calzada responded in less than three minutes. I knew the building. I was trying to figure out where the apartment was. No, I need you to just talk to me. Don't worry about the door. They're at the door, I think. Hold on. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I think if I throw them at the door. An overdose. Sheriff's office! Another overdose. This time, inside a home. Hey, where's she at? She's on the ground. The woman lies unconscious near her kitchen. White female, not conscious, not breathing for Baker 5 Her arms yes, limp and her hands blue. Hey. Hey. Seeing them unconscious and seeing somebody who's not breathing is, is always going to get your adrenaline up. Because you want to do everything you can to help that person. They have family members that care for them. They have loved ones. They might have kids. So you want to do everything you can to help them start breathing again so their loved ones have another day with them. Just like I want my family members to have another day with me or vice versa. Chris searches for time yeah. more often these days. Oh, what did she take? I, uh, she was drinking and she took one of the, uh, the blue pills. What blue yes. pill? The blues, the, the fentanyl pills that they're all taking nowadays. Desperate for precious seconds to save a life. Hope I did the right thing. People will use something thinking it's something else, and if it's laced with fentanyl, you'll see a very uh, quick overdose. Boulder Police Deputy Chief Stephen Redford What's going on? saw his officers respond to nearly double the number of overdoses from 2020 to 2021. Did he take anything? Uh, I, th I think he was uh, smoking fentanyls. For all intents and purposes, a lot of times a per person is clinically dead, whereas they have no pulse, no breathing. Fentanyl leaves little time before an overdose turns into a death. Thank you guys for getting here quick. Naloxone or Narcan as some people know it 
reverses the effects of the drugs. Two, five, three, Narcan deployed. It's one of the tools that our officers won't leave the station without when they head out on their shift. You don't want this person that you're there to help to, to die. Um, so you're trying to do everything you can with what resources you have to help them. I hope I did the right thing. Take a 5 2 Narcan administer. This was the seventh time Deputy Calderon Calzada used Narcan last year. Yeah, her, her face was, uh, was completely blue. Her lips were blue. Um, Baker 5 2, I'm starting compressions on all the pulse. These are the seconds that matter most. Hey. Hey, you okay? Uh, Five to have a pulse again. That pulse was hers. I died. I was dead. I know not everyone believes in God, but that was a miracle of some sort. That was something. That was a miracle. The woman he saved on that December afternoon in Arapahoe County. He's an angel. Angel in a uniform. Asked us not to show her face or say her name. But this was a reality that I truly died. I um, was just thinking about what my dad would do, you know, how he would feel. She knew the pill she had was laced with fentanyl. Hey, wake up. The decision to take it was fueled by decades of addiction. Ah. What did you take? Uh, hey, I'm hey. scared. I'm scared. I get it that you're scared. Uh, I just had to give you an Arcan. I was obviously searching for the next high. So um, that was what was available, and I was willing to try it. It eats your soul up. It absolutely eats your soul. Sir, you got to wake up. Come, come, come on, come, come to on. Us, you're right, you're right. Come on. Come on. Come on, boss. Come on. Come on, you're okay. There you go. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. There you go. There you go. You just relax. I had to do two. Narcan on you. In the moments when there's still hope. She's alive, so it's all that counts. Lives change in seconds. Come on. No, I'm no, I'm fine. No, you're not. You just died. It makes me feel better knowing that she's doing better now. At least I, I had my part in helping her get to where she's at now. You only see it on movies. So wallet and her, her I, I, ID. I, I, I just made a real life movie right there. That's reality right there. It's not just the movies. That just happened. The woman you saw in those videos who survived the overdose credits, the deputy, and the man who called 911 after he found her unconscious with giving her a second chance at life. When the lungs stop working, there's a special machine that can do its job. It's intense and shows just how hard our healthcare professionals work to save lives. Remember the stress that hospitals were under during the pandemic, the high number of patients and overworked nurses because there just simply weren't enough to meet the demand. But through it all, there were incredible efforts made to save the lives of people diagnosed with COVID and other illnesses. In one case, a few dozen people spent a few months of their lives working to save the life of just one person. It's easy to see the world in black and white. When you see that. You can. Through an x-ray scan of the lungs. I mean, it's intense. Black shows air, that's good. That white shows infection. Looking at the x-rays and just seeing how everything's still white. And with an infection like this, death is all but certain. There were definitely days that we said, he's not gonna make it.
Intensive care during the pandemic required extraordinary measures, measures that took an extraordinary toll. If we can't fix everything, we can be there for you at the end. In two years, Dr. Luciano Lemo saw more death. It's tough. More death than he might ever care to recount. And yet, on these awful scans, he also saw a chance. This is a Hail Mary, and we hope it'll work. We just, we're blindfolded and we're stepping into the unknown. Into the unknown. Whole different level. With a mission. 24-7. And team. Multiple people. Unlike any other. It's a lot. You gotta be quick, and it's a lot of days. Unfortunately, yes. Just keep going, we stick with it. You're talking to the most amazing team on this planet. ECMO, or ECMO. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. For somebody that's never seen it before, for sure, it's intimidating. Intimidating because this machine pumps blood in and out of the body of a person immobilized and in a coma. It does what the lungs can no longer do. It feeds the blood oxygen. I don't know that we, at the beginning of the pandemic, recognized the number of patients that would need that amount of support. Nate McWilliams' body's response to COVID triggered an attack that rendered his lungs useless. We put this uh, big hose, it's a big, uh, looks like a garden hose about yay long and goes up and close to the heart. Here at Swedish, they'd used ECMO before the pandemic for an hour or maybe a day or two, but not like this, not for this long. How long are people on ECMO? It could range from days to months. Months? Yes. And that was, you know, part of the learning process for everybody of giving that opportunity for the lungs to have time to heal and recover. It is as labor intensive as any treatment you will ever find. Constant care, constant worry. And two months in, the team still saw very little black and too much white. And then we're, you know, week eight in and like we still haven't seen much progress. Sometimes you'd see them getting better and getting better over a couple days. And all of a sudden they go downhill really quickly. ECMO is it. If it fails, patients die. And many did, far too many. Sometimes that's pretty tough. And yet for every loss. So it can be done. It's really touching. <laughs> there was a story like this. You know what? This is the last day, like they're not coming back. And then the next day, you know what? A little bit, a little bit of improvement. Somebody saw something that was just enough to make everybody keep going a little bit more and a little longer. And I mean, thank goodness we did. In a black and white world, Nate McWilliams should be dead. And yet earlier this year, the man who spent three months in a coma connected to a machine that replaced his lungs returned. Very fortunate, very fortunate. To the very same ICU floor staffed by the very same people. I'm so happy to yeah. see you. Who spent those three months Can I give you a hug? trying to convince themselves they could save his life. And I feel good. I feel real good to see everyone. I'm glad everyone's still here, too. <laughs> That's a, uh, Doctors. That's the important thing. Nurses. Techs. Hey, how are you doing? Warner. Yes. How are you doing? A lot will be said about a pandemic that robbed us of so many. And so it would be foolish to not include at least a few words on the few who depended on the many to survive it. Everybody stood by my side and I was... <sighs> Nate McWilliams is here because a floor of people saw this and decided maybe, just maybe, if they waited and waited and waited, the doubt they all felt would be replaced with the kind of moment they all needed to finally, finally catch their breath. It's something that, you know, I never thought scientifically would be possible. Like you just, it's, it's a miracle. It's a, it's a scientific miracle happening in front of your eyes. It's really Thank you. She makes sure I'm okay. If nothing else, I'm all right. At Swedish Medical Center, there were a total of 12 ECMO patients. Half of those survived. Can't stress how labor intensive this is. Two nurses must watch the patient and the vitals 24 seven. 
Just to show my little sisters that it is attainable, as difficult as it might be sometimes. A group of first-generation college students are showing the importance of hard work and giving us a little more hope for our future. Graduation is an exciting time for any student, but in 2022, we met a group of teenagers who had one more reason to be excited about their next chapter. These teenagers are first-generation college students and might make you feel differently about where our world might be headed. Not every story includes okay. a precedent. All right, whatever. Yep. All right. A model. And we're having everybody do the same thing. Okay. A guide. Now? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Name, yep. name high school, college. High school, college, gotcha. My name is Nyla Hernandez. My name is Sean Nelson. I'm Joseph Osfa. My name is Jose Cabrera. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm the first in my family to go to college. Is it hard being the first? There is some sort of pressure to that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I'm a student at Arupe Jesuit High School. I am a senior at Orland High School. I am homeschooled. I am a senior at Bishop Matchbuff High School, and I plan on going to the University of Notre Dame. And I plan to attend CSU Fort Collins in the fall. And I'm planning on going to CU Boulder in the and fall. And I'm going to CU Boulder in the fall. In a world marked by cynicism, they exude the opposite. How excited are you for this next chapter in your life? On a scale of 1 to 10, a 12. <laughs> I'm very excited. The personification oh, so excited. of possibility. I'm really looking forward to it. This is, this is good. Joseph's parents came to the U.S. via Ethiopia. Even though I was born here and I was raised here, I was able to like really like get a sense for my identity. He plans to cut his teeth working on teeth. You want to go into dentistry? Dentistry, yes. Just because, like, I've had quite the uh, quite the experience with it. Like, I, I have braces right now, and this is my, I think I'm entering my fifth year. Yeah, I mean, dentistry, I don't know. I've, I'm kind of looking into it right now. And so the question then, is human life, is human existence still justified in that world? The boy asking about, like, carrying the fire and wanting that to be, like, the thing that keeps him going, I think that justifies their existence pretty well. Nyla plans on turning her college education into a lesson. What does that mean to you, to be first? First and foremost, just to show my little sisters that it is attainable, as difficult as it might be sometimes. How are you going to change the world? <laughs> oh, that's a difficult one. I think I might need a minute. One minute later, she said she'd like to teach. Are you driven? Yes, definitely. Jose's parents came to the U.S. via Mexico. With me, they've always emphasized that education is uh, something that I should dedicate myself to. He says he'll get his act together putting things together. I plan on studying mechanical engineering. Welcome to the Cherry Creek Options Homeschool graduation. John learned a lot at home. Once a week, he studied with others in this enrichment program. He wants to study history. Why? Well, to know history, you know, those who don't know it are doomed to repeat it, they say so. We are so proud of you and can't wait to see what battles you win next. He credits his dad's recent recovery from a traumatic brain injury. How's your dad doing now? He's doing fantastic. Oh, yeah. For reminding him of the power of perseverance. <laughs> I do. I do feel optimistic for the future. The future. Finally being able to like help my parents and everything, making sure that they can live a comfortable life. For those who find themselves among the first, the future is definitely daunting. Might seem overwhelming. And yet here, futures in good hands. And I like to think so. Their futures represent opportunity. My mom is one of the most hardworking people I know. And my dad, in a similar way, just stressed the importance of education. I like to see it as I'm accomplishing the dreams that they had, that they got close to. Stories without precedent. Okay. Stories they're still writing.
It's like the one thing that I've been looking for my whole life is um, something new, something different, and something that I can experience for my own. Hey, like I'm, I'm doing this thing and I'm starting it and I'm going with it. I don't know where it's gonna take me, but you know what? We'll see how it goes. We will indeed. Yeah, I'm just really grateful for it. Each of these students are recipients of the prestigious Daniel Scholarship Program. And thanks to the folks at the Daniels Fund for getting us in touch with them. And we want to thank you for spending the last hour with us for our Nine News original special. We hope you found these stories as meaningful as we have. And maybe, just maybe, they've given you a new perspective. <laughs>